afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Case Western Reserve University's Law, uh, School of Law's Distinguished Lecture in Law, Technology, and the Arts. Uh, I'm Professor Raymond Koo, one of the co-directors here at the law school. Uh, Professor Jacqueline Lipton is here, one of my other co-directors, and Professor Craig Nard is our founding director, but he's unfortunately not able to join us at this moment. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank uh, Nancy Pratt and Alice Simon, who, without their work, these events could never be held. Uh, and they're, unfortunately, responsible for herding all the academic cats, uh, both in our program and in the other academic programs here at the law school. So thank them very much. Uh, and our speaker this year is Professor Julie Cohen uh, at, from Georgetown Law Center. Uh, she teaches and writes about intellectual property and privacy law. Uh, Professor Cohen is a prolific writer and perhaps uh, more importantly, one of the best and in my opinion, most thoughtful intellects in the field today. Uh, not only do I teach from her copyright casebook, uh, years ago when I began my teaching career, uh, I was asked to pick one article that would both kind of enlighten and provoke discussion uh, from my area of expertise uh, for a group of fellow junior faculty. And yeah, those of you who are not in academia, yes, that's what a lot of law professors do in their spare time. Uh, they read scholarship and talk about other people's works. Uh, and I picked uh, Professor Cohen's article, The Right to Read Anonymously, and uh, cool. uh, to this day it remains one of uh, that group's favorite and most thoughtful discussions. Uh, let's see. Uh, what distinguishes Professor Cohen's work is not only her breadth of knowledge and depth of understanding, <laughs> uh, but the care in which she takes to avoid the rhetorical extremes and partisanship that can too often be found in public and academic discourse. Uh, there's a tendency to view every issue, every problem through a simple binary lens. Uh, you either for free internet or for corporate oligarchy, or even worse, you're for Big Brother. Uh, you're either for copyright or for piracy, or as my favorite pair of posters from the modern humorist uh, quipped, you're either uh, for downloading communism or you're rocking out with the man. Uh, while these rhetorical flourishes can uh, be both amusing and entertaining and are obviously the bread and butter for many a talking head, uh, <laughs> Professor Cohen's work both illuminates and critiques the way these binary choices fundamentally fail to address the complex and difficult problems and the important values and tension at the heart of the challenges we face as law and the arts respond to advances in technology. I have no doubt that her talk today, The Changing Meaning of Unauthorized Access, will continue in this admirable tradition and as she explores the concept of access in an increasingly networked society. So uh, please join me in welcoming our distinguished lecturer in law, technology, and the arts, uh, Professor Julie Cohen. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is um, one of the great law and technology programs in the country. It is always wonderful to be here. You see me before you today somewhat disabled, so I'm sitting on a large stool and I may clunk the podium with my large space boot, uh, but I'll try not to distract you too much. So, um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about why we should all be spending a lot more time thinking about what unauthorized access means within our legal system. And I want to start with um, some descriptive claims and, and talk a little then about what unauthorized access uh, is coming to mean. So the descriptive claims, um, disputes over technical mediation of access to information are increasingly prevalent within our legal system. But despite the increasingly uh, increasing prevalence of such disputes, our legal system provides relatively poor tools for resolving them. So consider some of the very different contexts in which these disputes arise. Uh, first, digital music and video formats. So suppose you have a laptop with a Windows compatible DVD player and you want to strip out all of the Windows software and run Linux and associated open source applications instead. You still want to play commercially available DVDs though, so you hack into the Windows Media Player's DVD player copy control system to figure out how to write your own open source player to play commercially available DVDs. Under a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, otherwise known as the DMCA, that's illegal. And the prohibition extends not only to commercial conduct or conduct aimed at enabling infringement, but also to most tinkering by private individuals. Now suppose you say, well, I didn't hack the DVD copy control software. I reverse engineered it. That's legal, isn't it? 
Congress recognized that reverse engineering is important for both innovation and competition in software markets, so it created an exception to the DMCA's prohibition that allows circumvention to achieve interoperability. So why doesn't that exception shield reverse engineering of media players? On the one hand, media players are software. On the other hand, that reading of the statute would essentially negate the statute's main prohibition, so courts have found ways not to reach it. But why shouldn't concerns about innovation and competition apply to media players too? Or to put the point differently, the frameworks of innovation and competition don't seem to point us to a principled way of distinguishing between media players and software, which is not a distinction at all, or between illegal hacking and reverse engineering. And neither framework really addresses the interests of users who just want to make their own devices work better. OK, now suppose you have an iPhone, and you want to use it with a wireless carrier other than AT&T. That you can do because a different provision of the DMCA authorizes the Copyright Office to create exceptions to the anti-circumvention rule when necessary to enable access to particular classes of works. So the Copyright Office created an exception allowing the circumvention of access controls on mobile phone software for that purpose. Unlike the reverse engineering exception, this one is motivated by consumer protection concerns. Tying phones to networks just seems unfair. But now suppose Apple threatens that future firmware upgrades to the iPhone will make hacked iPhones incompatible with iTunes by, say, turning them into bricks. In theory, tinkering with your iPhone to fix this problem would now be prohibited by the DMCA because now it targets the media player even though you're just doing it to stay on the other carrier's network. There are a couple things wrong with this picture. First, it's unsatisfactory to think of Apple's being the one with the final power to determine whether a particular act of circumvention is lawful or unlawful. Second, the categories on which the law relies are unsuited to an age of technological convergence. The iPhone is a media player, a piece of software, and a piece of consumer equipment. And we need a more unified framework for evaluating questions about access to it. Third, and most fundamentally, again, none of the underlying conceptual frameworks addresses what seem to be the core concerns of users in this situation. The idea of freedom to tinker with your own device doesn't fall within the innovation framework, the competition framework, or even the consumer protection framework. Now consider electronic voting. The accuracy of electronic voting results is increasingly controversial, but the software used to operate the machines is proprietary. The companies that make the machines have invoked trade secrecy protection to keep it that way, despite repeated and troubling complaints about processing glitches and predetermined selections. When students at Swarthmore College got hold of leaked information suggesting flaws in Diebold's electronic voting software and posted the information online, Diebold asserted copyright to protect their interests and argued that the students had violated, yes again, the DMCA by posting the information online. The court ruled that once the information had already been leaked, the DMCA couldn't be used to protect it. That was clearly right. Diebold's invocation of the DMCA was simple expedience, but that resolution does nothing to create a right to examine the software in the first place, and the software mediates an important public function. Okay, now consider government profiling. What algorithms is the TSA using now? And how did those names on the no-fly list get there in the first place? We tend to act as though the Federal Freedom of Information Act should automatically give us rights to that information, but in fact, the FOIA framework is indeterminate on that question. To add insult to injury, the information used to construct the TSA's algorithm may be withheld even though much of the information needed to operate the system may have been purchased from private sector data brokers in the first place, from commercial entities who assert that they collected it from us with our implied consent. Now consider search engines and social networking sites. In 2006, AOL released a large database of user search strings, and it turned out that with some not too difficult reverse engineering, individual users who entered the search strings could be identified. In response to widespread public outrage, AOL took down the database. Similar results followed the Facebook real-time data feed fiasco, um, that's when a, a Facebook added a data feed to all its users' profiles that gave real-time updates every time Facebook friends changed their status. So you would get a news flash, so-and-so is now single. 
Um, and then the more recent Facebook beacon fiasco, this one uh, involved the addition of commercial, commercial purchase data to Facebook users' status updates uh, and gave commercial partners of Facebook access to the purchase data. It turned out that many users didn't want their friends to get real-time notifications of every change to their profiles and didn't want to be turned into promotional agents for products they had purchased. At least they wanted to be able to turn the features off. Again, public outrage carried the day, and the mandatory aspects of the system were changed into opt-out aspects. Uh, the story doesn't always play out the same way, though. So when Google released its Gmail service, users flocked to it, even though Google acknowledged that it would target ads based on the content of the emails. For those users, evidently, the possible harms that privacy advocates identified felt too remote or indefinite to matter. And absent public outrage, no legal rights existed for users who were troubled about those features to invoke. In all of these cases, absent some binding promise by the technology company, there is no legally cognizable privacy interest in information that the users had voluntarily disclosed or that another party to a transaction also possessed. And efforts to gain information about how those AOL or Google search algorithms work or about what exactly Facebook was planning on doing with that beacon commercial purchase data would run into a different legal discourse about unauthorized access to, trade to information, again, the discourse of trade secrecy. Questions about the scope of trade secret protection for search engine algorithms come up repeatedly in lawsuits about page rankings and search results, and every time courts say that the search and ranking algorithms are trade secrets that search engines can withhold. Once again, that discourse is driven by concerns about innovation and competition, and once again, it doesn't match up very well with the sorts of concerns that users have. As this set of examples shows, and I could go on and on, but I'm supposed to actually do something with, with the examples, we are accustomed to classifying disputes like these within doctrinal stovepipes. So disputes about digital media technologies are about copyright. Therefore, disputes about unauthorized access to digital media files have to be governed by the DMCA. Disputes about profiling are about privacy, and they get different legal treatment according to the state action doctrine. So uh, disputes about government profiling are governed by one set of rules, uses of personal information by commercial entities governed by another set of rules, and so on and so on. There are a couple problems with that approach, though. First, as we've seen, the rules for resolution that operate within each of the stovepipes aren't always a model of analytical clarity. Think again about that elusive distinction between media players and software, and you'll see what I mean. Um, second and more fundamentally, these disputes are animated by common concerns that typically go unrecognized because the legal tools don't address them. Arguably, each of these examples is not just about the accessibility of information, but also about something else altogether, uh, and that is the accessibility of the technical rules that shape the networked information environment. And arguably, the public outrage that followed each of these episodes, re episodes reveals an anxiety that isn't about copyright or privacy or voting or profiling per se, but instead it's about the shaping of the networked information environment that surrounds each of us. As implemented, each of the technologies I've discussed, uh, protected by the legal structures that I've discussed, presents a confluence of technical and legal conditions that operates to obscure the structure and the operation of the networked information environment from those who inhabit it. There's a sense that we're losing the ability to control these processes or even to know that much about them. Existing laws, indeed, are overwhelmingly likely to tell us that most user efforts to gain access to that sort of information should be prohibited. So perhaps then we need a different and more comprehensive framework for thinking about unauthorized access. Now moving over to the academic side of the ledger, academic discussion of technically mediated access has been equally unproductive. The prevailing framework for those discussions has been the one supplied by Lawrence Lessig in his 1999 book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. In that book, Lessig provocatively argued that code is law. Now on Lessig's own account, that was not really intended as a statement of literal equivalence. Rather, he used law as a metaphor designed to draw our attention to the ways in which code shapes behavior. That, though, leaves open more questions than it answers. If law is just a metaphor, how should code be understood? 
Well, legal scholars have taken three different approaches to this problem. Some of them take Lessig's equation of code and law literally, even though he said not to, uh, and then try to invoke the same legal principles that we use to decide whether laws violate rights. That results in a mismatch that's both doctrinal and conceptual. First, and obviously, state action is not involved in most of these disputes. Uh, more fundamentally, though, legal frameworks concerned with individual rights don't tend to work well here because those types of, of analyses are chiefly concerned with identifying impermissible coercion against a presumed background condition of liberty to do whatever you want. Um, all architectures, though, constrain liberty in some way. So the dichotomy between liberty and coercion that animates uh, particularly a lot of our constitutional jurisprudence doesn't help us much. Each potential digital architecture permits a range of behaviors between pure liberty and pure constraint. Uh, and so simply problematizing constraint isn't going to be very helpful uh, to us in figuring out what is going on. Other scholars, uh, because of the absence of state action, resist equating code with law, and, so, and they argue that anxiety with code is much ado about nothing. Uh, code, they say, is in and of the market. It's produced by private market entities. So regulation by code should be understood as market ordering. Here again, there's a mismatch, though, uh, because the tools that we customarily use to evaluate market ordering um, don't square that well with the way that code works. Dis digital architectures turn out to be extraordinarily path dependent, and they can operate over time to constrain market choice in ways that the pure market model doesn't usually envision. And the architectures that I've talked about, the examples that I gave, aren't pure products of market decision making. Instead, they emerge at points of convergence between private and public interest, typically in ways that serve the goals of both state and market actors. A final group of scholars argue that code is not like law because it is a form of regulation that is unique in the history of human affairs. They say code is uniquely plastic, ex, uh, uh, ex ante, and uniquely inflexible, ex post. So before you write it, you can write it any way you want, but after you've rolled it out in the marketplace, it does what it does. Uh, and therefore, they say, code presents new ideological problems. That argument sounds in a crude technological determinism that is thoroughly discredited among other academic fields that study technology and that has little correspondence to reality. Code exists and develops in social contexts and those contexts tend to evolve and shift over time as a result of what people want, of institutional pressures and interest group agendas brought to bear on particular problems. So in the minds of legal scholars then, code, as Lessig described it, has become a sort of information age Rorschach test. We look at the network information environment through the lens that Lessig provided, and we see what we were already worried about. Whether or not Lessig intended it that way, the framework he provided in code invites that sort of oversimplification. It is too easy to understand law and code and the market as distinct Newtonian vectors, just the way Lessig, in fact, diagrammed them at the beginning of the book, and to overlook the synergies among them and the fact that, again, they are strategies deployed by actors to serve self-interested goals. And it is too easy to think of the forces of regulation as simply pushing the autonomous individual this way or that, again, just the way Lessig diagrammed it in his book, uh, without producing fundamental changes in either our culture or our character. But those frameworks bring us no closer to understanding what code does and what it means for social governance more generally. So what happens if we relax the focus on code and consider the larger contexts within these, which these architectures are emerging and evolving? If we do that, first, we discover there is much more in play here than just architecture or just code. Uh, so consider um, three sets of trends that are emerging in the digital networked environment. Um, first, a, 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 a um, set of developments around um, computer security, uh, exemplified by the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA. That statute was originally designed to regulate access to computerized information systems, but it's become in the hands of courts and litigants, a tool widely used to police website terms of use. 
It's deployed within institutional context to set parameters for appropriate marketplace behavior by, uh, by consumers and competitors of website operators. Next, technical systems intended to police copyrights are not simply developing in a vacuum. Instead, they represent one prong of a more diversified portfolio of strategies for controlling the shape of the digital media environment. And those strategies range from laws directed at equipment manufacturers and net network intermediaries like ISPs to contractual regimes designed to enroll those entities in authorized licensing regimes uh, to rhetorics of piracy and theft intended to make us all think differently about our own practices of media use. And finally, consider the context of privacy and security. There, technical systems for profiling citizens, both public and private, are increasingly linked to a variety of other strategies for monitoring both personal mobility and communications traffic. Uh, so we see a constellation of developments in both public and private sectors that radically increases the degree to which movements, communications, and transactions are monitored, generate permanent records, which can then be cross-referenced and linked, uh, and used to undergird systems of authentication uh, for new transactions and new communications and new movements around the country or across borders. Again, these developments are not simply technological but involve a variety of other mechanisms and strategies, ranging from legally imposed data retention mandates to rhetorics that urge us all to be simultaneously fearful of wrongdoers and eager to divulge our own personal information to legitimate commercial and government entities. Under the circumstances, to say that these developments exemplify regulation by code, pure and simple, seem more than, seems more than a bit obtuse. There is much more in play here than just architecture. Uh, new systems of social ordering are emerging where the incentives and interests of these government and private entities overlap. Next, focusing on code alone leads us to ask the wrong questions about how code regulates. As I've already noted, we tend to evaluate laws by asking whether a law constrains behavior in impermissible or undesirable ways. Consistent with that orientation toward constraints on our liberty, legal scholars have tended to focus on what digital architectures prohibit. Taking a broader perspective, though, on these developments enables us to shift our focus to what they allow and how they allow it. The new structures that I've described do more than simply establish prohibitions, in fact. They establish new political economies organized around precisely defined and carefully controlled authorization of access. Access to spaces, access to websites, access to information, resources, access to databases, access to transactional privileges. As those political economies emerge and grow more complex and more tightly interlinked, Unauthorized access and authorized access are becoming defining themes of the emerging networked information society. So let's now consider more carefully the three trends I described just a moment ago. Um, so first, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and computer system security. The CFAA was enacted to solve a new information age problem, that of safeguarding the integrity of network digital information systems. The presumption, though, was that that goal could be achieved by defining protected computer systems which were understood as relatively self-contained entities, as islands within a larger sea of unregulated network behavior. Um, and that computer security could be safeguarded by regulating access only to those entities. And the threat that the CFAA sought to address was conceived as arising primarily from the outside in the form of malevolent hackers pursuing a high-tech form of vandalism. Now, if we shift our focus to copyright, internet distribution of digital media files raises problems that are vastly different in scale. If we assume for the moment that the desire to control the terms of access to such files is always a legitimate one, we realize immediately that that problem can't be solved by establishing self-contained protected enclaves, islands of security in a sea of otherwise unregulated conduct. If the files are broadly distributed, so too must access controls be. And this means that processes for authorization also must be broadly distributed across any device capable of playing the files. The threat, meanwhile, has also become far more broadly distributed and far more protean. Although we, although we presume that the threat 
is emanating in the first instance from skilled hackers, who are the ones that could break the technical protection systems, the figure of the hacker now coexists uneasily with the idea that the real locus of our distrust is the ordinary user, all of us who can't be trusted to do with our media files only what the copyright owners want us to. When we move finally to the domain of privacy and security, the presumptions that animated this, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act are completely inverted. Access, authentication, and authorization are increasingly necessary even to navigate the most mundane transactions of everyday life, to get money from the bank, to buy groceries at the store, to enter your parking garage, um, uh, and so on. The authorized inside is now all around us, and we become the outsiders who need authorization to access it. Now, arguably all I've done in my first uh, 23 minutes of talking is to make things more complicated. How does recasting the problem of code in terms of political economies of authorization help us at all to decide how the law should approach these developments? And in particular, why should we worry about emerging technical, legal, and architectural systems that define authorized access in this new and more precise way? Um, so I have two answers for you on those questions. One answer relates to what we purport to value in our political discourse. So officially, our political discourse about information and about the networked information society is organized around central themes like progress and freedom of information and freedom of speech, um, themes that are legacies of our liberal uh, uh, political theory tradition and cornerstones of our system of constitutional government. For exactly those reasons, though, we tend to pay insufficient attention to the way that secrets and spectacles and technical mystification play roles in structuring the political economy of the networked information environment. In the domain of unauthorized access that I've just described to you, much of the political economy of the networked information society is organized around secrets. State secrets, in the case of the TSA profiling algorithm, trade secrets, in the case of most of the other examples, uh, and the increasingly central role of secrecy in undergirding these systems of authorization has proved relatively impervious to rhetorics of open access for three reasons. First, legal frameworks designed to ensure open government and promote private sector innovation are in fact indeterminate on the optimal amount of openness that they permit, and you could see that in the examples I gave. Uh, and so they're deployed to reinforce secrecy in many cases. That's what trade secrecy law is all about. Second, the emerging regimes of authorization deploy spectacle and moral panic to legitimate and reinforce regimes of state secrecy and trade secrecy. So in the context of copyright, we have seen that moral panics about piracy are used to reinforce legal prohibitions against unauthorized access. And in the context of privacy and security, we are whipsawed between moral panics about security and terrorism and voyeuristic fascination with the spectacles generated by our own self-exposure, uh, by those nude party photos that the undergraduates put on Facebook, um, by the fact that you can Google just about anyone who's had any sort of public uh, presence and find out things about them and bring all of that information together. Uh, it fascinates us and we want to see more. And in the context of security, authorization and authentication are repositioned as objects of desire, not simply because we want to see more, but also because authorization becomes a commodity that's available for purchase that can give us convenience, portability, preferred customer treatment, access to the TSA uh, special speedy screening line. Uh, and this induces us to reveal more and more of our own information to entities that can credibly claim they merit our trust. And finally, in the domain of technology policy, we have long been accustomed to placing enormous faith in markets, precisely on the ground of their relative openness and responsiveness to concerns about innovation and competition. As a practical matter, though, that faith has operated to shift decision-making processes with enormous political importance into the realm of technical standard decision-making. Uh, consider, again, those voting machines. Often processes are closed, undertaken by a consortium of private companies or maybe by a single firm like Google. Uh, and even in open standards processes, there is typically not very much inquiry into the fitness of technical elites to make what are fundamentally governance decisions. So in all of these cases, rhetorics of openness seem to function partly to mask how little openness there really is. 
But that change to our political culture is worth noting and worrying about. At least it's worth discussing because openness has served us very well for a very long time. Uh, the second answer I have to give you about why this matters relates to what we purport to value within ourselves, to the habits of independent behavior and thought and expression that are part of our cultural mythology. Uh, the most serious problem with regulation by code, I submit, arises because of the ways in which the new political economies of authorization shape and reshape the reality of our everyday experience of the networked information environment. So what do I mean by the everyday experience of the networked information environment. Well, uh, first something about what it isn't. Although digital public interest groups love to bring First Amendment lawsuits challenging laws prohibiting unauthorized access, everyday experience is not organized around grand themes of self-expression and principled dissent. Discuss discussions of the way network users behave in the legal literature ignore that and tend toward extremes. So you can find within the legal literature discussions of virtual reality, peer production of culture, Wikipedia, open source, um, that imagine users as all powerful beings who spend their days racing between posting uh, long reasoned diatribes about the presidential election on the internet, coding open source software in their basement, um, making high quality home-produced movies and entering them in the Sundance competition, um, and, and so on. Uh, and then there are literatures on surveillance and digital rights management that imagine network users as passive um, blobs uh, totally dominated by external forces. Uh, and that's you know, more than a bit of an oversimplification. The reality uh, of the digital networked environment is less dichotomous and much more interesting uh, than those treatments tend to suggest. Uh, and if we consider all of the ways in which people interact with the networked information environment as a matter of everyday practice, we get a very different picture of what they do. We use these technologies for a variety of purposes, many of which are quite mundane, finding directions, ordering groceries delivered, um, repurposing tools uh, for office-related tasks at hand, playing with cultural texts and putting uh, new pages up on our social networking site. And then we also use them for grander activities of authorship and community building. Uh, but our interactions with these technologies have many qualities. They're imitative, they're iterative, they're playful, uh, and they form the substrate out of which our culture and our beliefs and our identities and our communities take shape in this increasingly networked information age. The new political economies of authorization uh, seek to erect multiple roadblocks against that sort of everyday practice. Uh, most obviously, when everyday user innovation and repurposing bumps up against narrowly defined parameters of authorized activity, uh, the result is at odds with the way that human beings have always innovated uh, and evolved their culture. And it's that concern that has led opponents of the DMCA to call for a legally protected freedom to tinker with technology. More generally, though, the emerging regimes of authorization operate by seeking to create both a standardized, predictable network environment and standardized, compliant habits of behavior within it. In place of freedom to tinker, they seek to substitute a culture of permission seeking. In place of the independence of mind and action that we purport to value, they seek to instill attractability re reinforced by both fear of the unknown and desire for the security that we can purchase. But in remaking the conditions of accessibility in those ways, they may also remake things that are far more dear to us, like the conditions of our own subjectivity and our social identity as an independent, uh, ornery, innovative, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, determined people. Uh, and those changes in the fabric of our political com economy would not be trivial ones. It may very well be that some secrets are important enough or that some kinds of profiling are urgent enough to justify some of the architectural and institutional changes now underway, but that conversation is one that we need to have rather than simply assuming that it will all work out for the best. So how should law respond? Well, the conditions of accessibility to information resources and technical information should factor into law and policy making in a much more comprehensive way than they have heretofore done. 
Uh, and in brief, uh, law and policymakers should seek to mitigate the structural problems arising from these new political economies of authorization, rather than reinforcing them by passing yet more sets of laws prohibiting unauthorized access. This is most effectively done not in ruling on particular cases that fortuitously happen to come before the courts, but in legislating to preserve the breathing room for everyday practice that we have long taken too much for granted. I noted a moment ago that opponents of the DMCA's circumvention rules have advanced arguments for a right to tinker. That argument has never prevailed in court, and by now it's easy to see why. Uh, we've never given a, a good framework for justifying it. Um, the analysis I've sketched out, I think, supplies a more robust justification, uh, although still not one that's grounded in any identifiable provision of, say, the Constitution. Um, uh, we can see why we would want a freedom to tinker. Uh, tinkering enables individuals to gain access to the standards that define the architectures of the emerging networked information environment. But we can also see that freedom to tinker has only limited utility for addressing some of the other problems I've talked about, such as those involving voting rights systems, government profiling, uh, and, uh, and the operation of, of private commercial databases. So here, regulatory frameworks need to consider other ways of influencing the patterns of accessibility and inaccessibility that those technologies establish. One solution uh, might be to de develop and legislate policies designed to create greater transparency about the technical determinants of accessibility. So mandates for open code in some cases, disclosure of basic information about uh, the way that uh, closed systems operate in other cases, uh, uh, data retention protocols subject to limits in other cases. But even that, I think, would not take us everywhere that we need to go because transparency is retrospective with respect to the content of standards already developed. And policymakers, I would argue, should be more open to claims that users have interest to assert prospectively about the ways that standards should be developed. In some cases, those interests might be satisfied by guarantees of meaningful access to and representation in standards processes. But in other cases where particularly important policies are involved, we may want to consider imposing within standards processes certain substantive obligations that need to be honored. Now, among cyber law scholars, it is the custom to respond to suggestions of that sort by objecting that government has no role in dictating the content of technical standards. But we should be well past the point of needing to treat that as a serious objection. Government is already intimately enmeshed in the evolution of standards and practices that establish the new political economies of authorization. So it could be, and I would argue it should be, equally closely involved in ensuring that those standards do not interfere too greatly with the play of everyday practice and ultimately with what I would argue are conditions for human flourishing, for all of our well-being. Uh, at least, again, if we are to make meaningful progress in this area, we should be open to some serious discussion about what that goal requires. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop going on and on and take your questions. Yes. Um, your last comment. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't it uh, something like the, the fox guarding the hen house here? If the if the government is is concerned with uh, with giving us our liberty. The fox is guarding the hen house already. Um, government is uh, imposing data retention mandates on internet service providers, is requiring the creation of technical back doors to enable wiretapping. Um, every time a bill gets put into Congress, um, either to shore up the good old Patriot Act or to um, suggest some further protections for copyrighted content, you can identify provisions that kind of swing both ways. They, they are helpful for government surveillance purposes and also for copyright enforcement purposes. Um, so they're there. Um, the question is how we could make them be there differently. Um, but, but, to, to, but to imagine uh, that, that we could take the fox out of the hen house, I think, is totally unrealistic. Yes? Um, have you applied your uh, analysis at all to this uh, area of healthcare, electronic records in general, and 
Mm -hmm. in particular, who stimulus act uh, like twenty billion dollars to doctors and hospitals. Mm -hmm. as well I haven't applied it to the new Stimulus Act, um, but I clearly ought to go take a look at that. Um, I think that's a really good example of the fact that there isn't a single way that these systems have to be designed. Um, there are choices uh, that we could make about who has access. There are choices we could make about security and audit. Um, there are choices we can make about um, whether, uh, whether um, exploitation of this data in other contexts is rewarded or punished. Um, so it is a good example, and I know that um, privacy advocates have been in dialogue with the administration on how to achieve the efficiencies while preserving privacy protection. Um, which is which is always more difficult and more messy messy than than laying down an absolute rule one way or the other. Well, they lay down uh, pretty extensive rules. Mm -hmm. on the, their violations, if you violate quote unauthorized access, mm -hmm. fifty thousand dollars per violation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's pretty astounding. I'll take a look. Yeah, take a look. I will. Yeah, Jackie. Uh, you, you may or may not be able to answer this, but I've thank you. Uh, I was at a talk uh, last week by the executive officer of the American Intellectual Property Law Association, just mm -hmm. talking about how things are changing on Capitol Hill with respect, particularly to the IP uh, issues with the new administration. There didn't seem to be a lot of talk about looking at copyright, privacy, and access, it all seemed to focus a lot on patent. Do, do you get any yeah. sense about what the new administration may do in this area? Um, patent reform is a much more hot topic. Um, the, um, the copyright issues get complicated whenever the Democrats come into power, um, and, uh, and perhaps that should be all I would say. Um, but, but you c consider the base, right? Um, and, and do the math. Okay. So it, it, it tends not to look good no matter who's in power on the copyright side. Uh, Julie, given your, given your talk, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, many people might have read the New York Times, I believe it was two weekends ago, mm -hmm. where well, one of the stories was about how we need to, you know, basically produce another version of the internet uh, in order to avoid malicious hacks and the mm -hmm. spread of viruses. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's going to happen, how mm -hmm. would you recommend uh, that that proceed? What, what would you kind of envision given the concerns you've raised here? So this is, this is building off of Jonathan Zittrain's argument. Yes, no, maybe, no. or it was, it was different. All right. So, um, so then the argument takes a couple of forms. One is that there should just be another internet that is open um, and, uh, and uh, you enter it at your own risk. Um, and the other, which I identify more with, with Jonathan Zittrain's book, is that um, the open internet will sort of be all that's left and it will be full of viruses and hackers after we make everything else into a controlled appliance. Um, so that you can sit in your home and do your grocery shopping and your media watching and everything that you ordinary couch potatoes would do without actually going out into the open internet. Um, the, that, that way of describing what we should create is one that looks like it is um, prizing some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, but it does seem to kind of buy into the notion that there's a dichotomy between security and room to play, and that you can only have good enough security by banishing all of the uncontrolled, unpredictable, unregulated activity to somewhere else. Um, I am not and never have been a software engineer, 
But I would argue that one place we ought to start to, to see whether there's an alternative to that is by taking a good hard look at some of the practices that are employed to engineer these technologies and considering ways in which we could engineer them to be pretty good but imperfect, right? Um, so that um, personal data doesn't flow seamlessly everywhere in, a, in an interoperable way so that you could maybe make, you know, 50 or 100 copies of something, but not a million, um, so that there are uh, gaps in the system, but also circuit breakers, um, uh, so that things don't get totally out of hand. Um, because I think if we don't come up with something like that, we probably are going down the road towards the dichotomous um, you know, safe space and play space um, that's described. Uh, and, um, and I don't think that's where we want to be. So I really hope that there might be software people in here who could either speak on that or tell me I'm just smoking something, but um, no? Okay. Yes? No? Yeah. Could you address, while well, you talk about government while you talk about government being involved, unfortunately, government, especially our legislators, seem to be some of the most backwards people when it comes to technology mm -hmm. and the uses and the nuances of it. So how do we address that? That's really tough. I mean, we have right now an administration that is most definitely not backward. Um, that, that could, if motivated, nudge people in the right direction, and that has said that it's committed to things like network neutrality and innovation that, that are logically consistent with the sort of thing that I'm describing, other than there is that other copyright problem. Um, so uh, I, I don't think we are going to get anytime soon to a world in which all the members of Congress understand this stuff. Um, but some of them have very good staff. Um, and I, and I think that it would be possible to get to a world in which um, uh, if the issues are framed uh, in, in, uh, in a different way than they have been, uh, we could start to see some movement, um, even, if, even if it's movement without perfect comprehension. It's never going to be perfect. Are we good? Thank you very mm -hmm. much. On that, on that cheery note.